Welcome to another Wednesday Yachting Lunch. We look out our beautiful windows here at the St. Francis Yacht Club to about 60 knots of breeze and a few sailboats. Later on today, we'll be out there racing in the Wednesday night races, the second to the last one in the season. So we'll expect everybody nose and ears pressed against the windows looking out at the uh, race action. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. So we only have three open slots between now and the end of the year. So what do I tell you about? Uh, next week, you want to come by and listen to Chris Welch. He will be talking about underwater munitions, millions of tons of which got dropped after World War II as uh, boats returned to home bases in America. Uh, on September 5th, you want to stop by and listen to Rich Jeppesen talk about founding the Olympic Circle Sailing uh, Club, uh, doing what he loves to do as work. On September 19th, Michael Webster from the... Coral Reef Alliance will be here, and we have in the room with us today Dana Gaines and uh, Jim Lussier. She is a development director, and Jim is a member of our Yacht Club and a board director. Wave over here, guys. Give me a wave, Dana and Jim. Uh, they're going to talk when um, Michael Webster comes on September 19th. They're going to talk about the importance of coral reefs. Did you know that 25% of the world's food Billions of dollars in jobs, millions of jobs and billions of dollars in revenue come from coral reefs, and yet 75% of the coral reefs on the planet are in jeopardy and threatened. So they're going to tell us what we can do about it because they do believe there's hope, even though it's a you know, worrisome situation. Uh, on October the 3rd, uh, David McGuire will, hear, will be here to talk all about shark stewards, their activities, the author of books and lots of talks on sharks and skates and rays. When I was a little boy in Belvedere Cove, as you'd sail into the cove, we saw manta rays all over the place. Not so much anymore. He says they're coming back and he's going to talk about uh, why they are coming back. Um, Adam Wright will be here middle of October to talk about um, deep flight submarines, custom submarines that can be used as recreational devices at resorts. So those of you who were at the christening of Tom Perkins sub about a dozen years ago, it was a little two-man sub from here to the wall. These are actually in practical production these days. Uh, you've heard about 30 Knot Gourmet, very cool food for racing yachts. Uh, Tony and Landon, who founded that, will be here in uh, the end of October. Um, we'll hear from Bob Heller on November 14th. Bob Heller, you may remember, was governor on the Federal Reserve Board. Bob will be back to come and talk to us about whether there, what effect interest rates have on inflation and the economy in general. So we have great speakers between now and the end of the year. We look to see you come by to hear a bit about those. Our speaker today, first time he was on a boat that he can remember was water skiing on a lake, an inboard motorboat at about age five. It's unique how people get started and get their beginning addiction to boating of any kind. At 15 years of old of age, he can remember scuba diving in Catalina. And then the next real memorable boating activity was a birthday party in Newport Harbor. Those of us who had birthday parties in Newport Harbor love the place. And uh, so they were cruising around having a great partyish time. He would then go on to college to get a mechanical engineering degree from University of Washington and then an MS and a PhD in mechanical engineering and aeronautical engineering, uh, aerospace engineering at University of Washington. Uh, he got back to uh, Avila Beach and uh, power boating around in Southern California in between. And then a couple of years ago, while he was working at Sandia Labs in Livermore on zero emission maritime propulsion, it occurred to him, holy macaroni, this is going to be a monstrous field. And yet there's no company that is called zero a mission marine so he founded golden gate zero a mission marine now the person who of all folks has been to more of these luncheons than anybody here is our most uh pridesome member and that is the commodore of the saint francis yacht club so please uh, uh, welcome to our podium our commodore Teresa brandner the first female commodore of the saint francis yacht club 
Thank you, Ron. You actually remembered today you get a cookie, an extra cookie for lunch. Anyway, um, uh, welcome everyone, members, guests um, in the room, and those of you watching online. Next week, I'm gonna, I won't be here. I will be on my way to Newport, Rhode Island, and um, New York Yacht Club. So any of the New York Yacht Club members, uh, reciprocal um, club members that are watching, maybe I'll see you next week. But um, in the meantime, today we have a really exciting topic, great um Great idea, Joe, long ago to, to found Zero, Zero Emissions Marine. I think um, we re recognize the value that, that your company contributes to our marine, our waters, and keeping the bay cleaner. And um, so really looking forward to what you have to say today. And thank you, Ron, for remembering. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore. <laughs> thank you, Teresa. As you, all know, as you all know, in the governance of the St. Francis Yacht Club, we have a chairman of the board who manages the business matters and a commodore who manages uh, the spirit, esprit de corps, and exemplary conduct of members of our yacht club. And we could not be represented better than we are by our commodore, Teresa Branner. One more hand for Teresa. Thank you. So, Joe Pratt, come and tell us all about zero emission maritime power with Golden Gate Zero a mission marine. Joe Pratt. Thanks, Ron, for the nice introduction. Thank you, everybody at the St. Francis Yacht Club for hosting today. It's uh, fun to be back here. I was here when Charlie Walter spoke about hybrid electric vessels a couple months ago, and I'm glad to be back. Um, uh, Ron gave a my illustrious boating career, unfortunately, is pretty minimal, but I appreciate that. And I feel a little strange talking about zero emission vessels to uh, folks who own a lot of sailboats. You already know what that means. Um, but we're talking a little bit bigger stuff here. So anyway, let me get started on the talk. Um, so what I'm going to go through today is some introductions to myself and then to what is hydrogen and fuel cells, why hi hydrogen fuel cells from marine, and then what is Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine doing, um, the new project we have what you might have read about, and um, how to get involved. Uh, Ron already went through this. I guess one of the things I, I, I thought it's kind of funny when I look back on my career in fuel cells and hydrogen is uh, when I was at Washington in uh, 90, 96, 97, um, a professor came to me and said, the National Park Service wants to know if they can convert their tour boats at Crater Lake. Uh, over to electric, zero emission. So uh, I did a study as an undergraduate there to see if that could be done, and we looked at fuel cells, and I, I guess I can legitimately say I've been working on fuel cells in maritime for over 20 years uh, based on that experience. Um, I'm not going to go through everything here. The last eight years I spent at Sandia National Laboratories in Livermore, um, working on hydrogen fuel cells for vehicles and also for marine. It was about 50-50. And then, as Ron mentioned, um, uh, earlier this year I left Sandia and started Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine. And I have to make one correction. The PhD was from UC Irvine. So I know Joe Borgard in the audience is a fellow anteater, and I don't want to uh, <laughs> make sure we recognize UC Irvine here. Um, speaking of Sandia, just a brief overview of the work done there um, when I was there. Uh, you can visit the website for more information. I won't go through all these, but we looked at high-speed ferry here on the bay, research vessels. We looked at how to – we worked with the Coast Guard on how to get hydrogen on board a vessel safely. Uh, port power, optimizing vessels for cost and emissions. And then even looking at how – what is the real limit of this technology in um, application, could we go all the way up to thinking about large ships? The answer to the last one is yes, um, and I could talk more about that another time. So I talk a lot about fuel cells. What exactly is a fuel cell? Um, if you look at the, the picture over on the right, you can see sort of a, a bunch of plates here. Let me see if I can, oh yeah, this is working. Okay, so this picture here um, is, is what a fuel cell is. It's a plate, and on one side of the plate, you have hydrogen coming in, and the other side of the plate you have air. And when the hydrogen hits the plate, it reacts, it breaks apart. Electricity goes one way, electrons, and the, the rest of the hydrogen goes through the middle of the plate. On the other side you have air. The electrons come over, the hydrogen comes over, and they combine. Hydrogen plus oxygen makes water. So that's it. There's no moving parts, it's just this plate, and you have this chemical reaction, just like what happens in a battery 
um, makes electricity directly from hydrogen. The hydrogen and the oxygen never mix. It operates at a very low temperature, about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, nothing like the temperature uh, for engine combustion. What that means is it's very efficient. So it's much more efficient to take um, fuel and directly convert it to electricity than to burn it and then run a crank and then make power that way. So you get about twice the efficiency from a fuel cell as a, as a regular engine. Um, and you also don't have any emissions because you're, you keep everything at a very low temperature. So the picture in the middle here shows um, what, what you do with these plates. You stack them all up. There could be hundreds in this size of maybe a suitcase, a small carry-on suitcase. And then you take those suitcases and you stack them into what are called racks, which looks very much like a computer server. So this whole thing here is generating about this picture, about 150 horsepower, 120 kilowatts in this one rack. And to service this, you just sort of pull it out like a server rack. You can put it aside, put a new one, and put it in. And that's your overhaul procedure on your engine. That's about it. So a lot less maintenance, no moving parts. Um, on the right of this slide, I put some pictures of current places where fuel cells are used today. And not only um, some of the you know cars and trucks and trains, but locally here. Uh, the upper right is AC Transit, has a fleet of fuel cell buses. Um, there's a mobile light tower at San Francisco Airport. Um, in San Leandro, the Coca-Cola bottling plant uses fuel cell forklifts. And right here in Girardelli Square, there's a fuel cell providing backup power for the cell phone tower that's on top. Um, so they're all, they're all around us. They're being used every day. How exactly does a fuel cell work? This is one example um, from Toyota. So this is the Toyota Mirai. It's one of the fuel cell cars that you can buy or lease today. <clears throat> and what you have here is the fuel cell part of that. You have your fuel, which is stored in these tanks here. And then you have a battery. It's, it's a hybrid system. And that electricity from the fuel cell and the battery combine, and here's your big electric motor and controller. So again, that's, that's basically how a fuel cell car works. A battery car is very similar, but you don't have the hydrogen tanks or the fuel cells. You just have a very big battery system. All right, we talked a lot about hydrogen. What exactly is hydrogen? Um, I like to think of hydrogen very similar to natural gas. So a lot of us have natural gas in our homes for heating, um, cooking, whatever. Natural gas is actually, um, it, it's 80% uh, hydrogen. There's four hydrogens and one carbon in natural gas, uh, methane. Hydrogen is only hydrogen, just two H's there. So when you use natural gas, you have to, um, uh, account for the carbon, and you get things like CO, carbon monoxide, CO2, and when you burn it, you get um, NOx, uh, which is smog, basically. Um, because you don't have carbon and hydrogen and you use it at low temperature, you don't get any of that. You just get water and energy out. Hydrogen is also non-toxic, so unlike natural gas, you could breathe hydrogen. It's like helium. it make you talk funny, but it's not going to kill you. It won't make you sick. Um, also, hydrogen is not a, um, it doesn't harm any, any wildlife. Um, it's not a greenhouse gas itself. So the Office of Spill Prevention and Response in California is excluded hydrogen from any requirements when you're fueling your vessel. You don't have insurance or anything like that because it's not possible to spill it in the water and, and have a pollution. Hydrogen is the lightest gas. Um, let's see if this works here, if I can do this. Oh, okay, turn this off. So this is just a little animation of a balloon. If you were to release a small balloon of hydrogen here, um, it would go upwards at about 45 miles an hour. So that's like getting to the top of an eight-story building in five seconds. So it's, it's extremely light. Um, that has good and bad implications. The good is that if you ever have a leak of hydrogen, it's flammable like natural gas, and so it goes away very fast. That's great. Um, the bad is it's so light it's hard to contain. So it's hard to keep it inside of a small container. Um, I don't mean you can't make it in a container and not leak. I just mean it's hard to get it into a small size. So the volume of hydrogen when you're storing it is bigger than the volume of diesel or gasoline or natural gas. 
Um, most hydrogen today is made from natural gas. So even though you don't have any emissions on board the boat if you use it, um, you do have emissions associated with making the hydrogen. You can't just grab hydrogen out of the air. Hydrogen is actually so light, if it leaks into the air, it keeps going up and up and up and eventually leaks into space. So it's not really around us, even though it's in the water everywhere. Um, so you have to make it. You can make it from natural gas, which is what's done today most of the time. You can make it from biogas, biofuels. Um, and you can make it directly from water and electricity. And if the electricity comes from solar or wind, now you have a zero carbon from the very beginning, creation of the fuel to the very end, use of the fuel. These are just some examples of ways that people store hydrogen. So once you create it, how do you take it with you? Um, you can store it as a high-pressure gas, and there's cylinders, steel cylinders. You probably see these like welding cylinders, those types of things. There's high-pressure carbon fiber cylinders. This is what is used on the fuel cell vehicles today, and they're much lighter and smaller um, than the, the steel cylinders, so that's why they're preferred. You can store it as a very cold liquid, about 20 degrees above absolute zero. Not quite as cold as liquid helium, but it's the second coldest um, liquid gas. And then there are other ways that I won't really talk about today that people are looking into research and development. So when I talk about hydrogen, I usually get asked a couple questions. Um, one of them is, uh, when I was in Hawaii doing a project, uh, that port power when I was talking about, one of the dock workers said, well, I don't want to get near a hydrogen bomb. And I said, well, it's good you told me that, because I work at Sandia, and we also make bombs. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not what I did, so I know a little bit about those. Um, so fact number one, a hydrogen fuel cell is not actually a hydrogen bomb, um, which is if anybody saw Terminator 3, it's too bad for Arnold there. Um, so a hydrogen bomb has to have just a little bit of a, uh, education. A uh, hydrogen bomb actually has to have a regular nuclear bomb inside of it to make it go, and it doesn't even have hydrogen in there. It has isotopes hydrogen. So don't worry, the fuel cell will not blow up like a hydrogen bomb. Um, the other question I usually get asked when talking to people is um, not that I don't want a hydrogen bomb here, but, oh, that thing is just going to go up like the Hindenburg. So hydrogen safety has come a long way since the Hindenburg, which was over 80 years ago. Um, the Hindenburg used these rubber gas bags coated in flammable paint. Um, we don't do that anymore. We have learned over 80 years how to safely create, handle, uh, store, and use hydrogen. Um, every day we have 30,000 tons of hydrogen are produced in the United States, produced, transported, and used. So we've, we've pretty much figured out how to do it safely. Um, since the time of the Hindenburg. Oh, and this picture here with the, the person holding these sort of two half rounds, these are the cut sections of those carbon fiber tanks I showed in the previous section. So you've got like an inch of carbon fiber here. Um, there's some stories of tanks being mounted on top of trucks and buses, and they hit a bridge, and the bridge has a big hole in it, and the truck is obliterated, but the tank is just fine. So. <laughs> To hold 10,000 or 5,000 PSI, these tanks are extremely um, tough. All right, I will get into um, why are we looking at fuel cells for marine. And I'm going to start with regulations, and then I'll talk about how we can do it with technology. I'm going to run through this fast um, so I don't run out of time. So the IMO, International Maritime Organization, has sulfur regulations that limit the amount of sulfur that can be in the fuel. Um, that's a regional regulation now, but it's going to be a worldwide regulation in 2020. So a lot of um, folks are looking at switching to LNG as a way to, um, it's either LNG or pay a premium for low sulfur bunker fuel, right? So that's um, one of the options is LNG to combat that. NOx is smog forming chemicals. Um, that regulation is coming um, special areas around the Baltic and the North Sea, around the United States, and China is putting in their own NOx uh, area. And there's some concerns whether um, LNG can actually meet the NOx requirements. They might have to add additional after-treatment on the exhaust there, so people are starting to wonder what they're going to do. Particulate matter is a fancy word for soot. Um, soot, black carbon, is another way to say it. 
That's an issue, especially in the Arctic areas where the um, soot from the smokestacks can get onto the ice. It absorbs more heat and it melts the ice faster. So there are regulations probably coming. Everybody sort of expects those within the next 10 to 15 years. And how are you going to meet those is another question. And then we have greenhouse gas regulation. So greenhouse gas is um, carbon dioxide or methane or other things that leak into the atmosphere and then they trap heat um, so the planet warms up. Um, so IMO in April of just this year established a new regulation or goal, I think it's actually a goal, to reach the peak of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, which means we have to start going down as soon as possible, not up and reduce the total greenhouse gas emissions to 50% uh, of what they are today, or of 2008. Um, so how are you gonna do this? The only way to get rid of greenhouse gas emissions is to get rid of the carbon in your fuel. Carbon going in, you're gonna have carbon coming out, and that is primarily um, CO2. So you need to go to a low carbon or zero carbon fuel to do that. There are ways to do that, like renewable diesel or, or bio LNG, um, but those don't give you the pollution, um, don't meet the pollution criteria. So hydrogen is one way to get this totally zero carbon, zero emission solution. This chart just shows, in my opinion, that this goal of IMO, which is um, sounds great, it's actually extremely challenging. Um, so you have the maritime greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sorry, pointer here. Um, maritime greenhouse gas emissions today were about 800, or sorry, about, yeah, about 800 um, million tons per year. And IMO wants us to get to 50% of that. Well, you can see even going to non-fossil fuels and 60% efficiency improvement, we won't get there. So it's an extremely aggressive target, even though it kind of sounds like, oh, just 50% reduction. And the reason why it's so difficult is because of the chart on the left, which shows the increase in shipping uh, expected over the next 30 years. So we have to not only bring the emissions down of the existing vessels, but every new vessel, and you see almost an exponential growth here in shipping, we have to take care of those as well. And it's not just IMO policies. So around the world, um, there's different governments enacting different policies. Even individual ports are putting in place incentive programs or penalty programs um, to uh, incentivize clean ships. Um, so it's, uh, it's happening all over, the, and the momentum is really building here. So how are we going to do all this? Um, here's kind of the, the uh, spectrum of technology options today. We have the Tier 4 diesel, which is sort of the state-of-the-art diesel system um, that you can use to meet the emissions requirements. That gives you low NOx, low SOx. It doesn't change CO2 um, unless you're using a biofuel. Uh, you can get more efficiency improvement by going to an electric hybrid. Um, that, and that will help to lower your uh, carbon dioxide footprint. LNG engines will eliminate your socks, but they're questionable on what they actually do with the carbon dioxide emissions. And then all, the really the only way to get to zero is all electric, either a battery or a fuel cell. So speaking of batteries and fuel cells, um, there are, they, they are complementary in what they can best support. So a, a fuel cell, a battery is the simplest form of getting energy, right? It's just sitting there, you have electricity available, it goes to your motor, you're done. You don't really have anything to do uh, with a battery system. So if, you're, if your vessel can be powered by a battery, it's probably the best, best choice. Uh, but there's some things that um, batteries just can't do. So, so what we found in research at Sandia was the batteries are really best suited for uh, short range trips and ones where fuel cells can't really work are these really high power short range trips. So a very fast ferry you can imagine going back and forth between San Francisco and Oakland. If it can charge every time it docks at San Francisco and Oakland, that's a great fit for a battery. Um, but if it can't, now, it ha if it has to run all day like that, now you've got more of a long range high power and you've got to do something like a fuel cell to get through that, okay? So it really depends on your situation. Um, but And by the way, this kind of um, trade-off here, this complementary nature of batteries and fuel cells is the same thing in the vehicle space. 
So you hear a lot of people talking about, oh, fuel cell cars don't make sense, or battery cars are dumb, or whatever it is. There is a complementary uh, nature with batteries and fuel cells in the automotive market, and it's a very similar relationship here. Short trips, places where you can charge, get a battery car. Um, people who are running their cars all day or you want to run a truck between here and New York, you might have to do it with a fuel cell. Um, I won't spend too much time on this just to say hydrogen vessels are more flexible than battery only because you don't have the shore infrastructure. Um, you are freer to go where you want. You have longer range. It's more like a diesel boat than it is um, uh, something uh, like a battery. You almost have to think of it as ha having a cord follow you. Fuel cell, uh, hydrogen fuel cells can be fueled just like diesel. So a truck shows up, hose rolls out, fuels the boat, the truck leaves, and there's nothing left on the dock. So that's the same way you can fuel a fuel cell, is just like a uh, diesel. And whether that's high-pressure gas fuel or liquid hydrogen. I talked a lot about regulations as a motivation for going to zero emission, but it's not just about regulations and emissions. Um, if you can use hydrogen now and create it from solar or wind, you've insulated yourself from fossil fuel price increases or uh, fluctuations, volatility. As I mentioned, you have just a couple moving parts instead of hundreds, so your maintenance requirements have gone way down. It's a simpler system. Uh, you end up with a lower total cost of ownership. You have no noise, no exhaust on board. Makes your riders or your customers happy. You can get um, the, really the green marketing value for your brand, and then um, all this r translates to higher revenue. How do we put this together? Well, there's nothing really new here. As I said, I started looking at fuel cells over 20 years ago. It's not new technology. It's been improved over the years, that's for sure. Um, but everything to build these systems is off the shelf. So this top left uh, picture here of the diesel hybrid, this is a BAE Systems um, uh, that, that company from back east. They make this drivetrain system, and it's actually going on red and white fleets, new, new vessel, the Anhydra, which will be here in a few weeks, and on the Matthew Turner, which Charlie Walter um, uh, talked about uh, a couple months ago. These are both Bay Area vessels with this BAE system, and we're using the same system on the new boat, the water go round. Um, you can see all we've done is replace the diesel engine with the fuel cell, and you've got all the rest of the same parts. A quick summary of the technology. So diesel, LNG, um, battery electric, and fuel cell. Fuel cell really gives the best of both. So it has the flexibility of diesel, but the zero emission and, and simple maintenance requirements of batteries. All right, let me get to uh, almost at the end. Ron, I might go over a couple minutes. Uh, but I'll then talk about what we're doing at Golden Gate Zero and the vessels. So we were formed in 2017, really officially early 2018 when I left Sandia, um, doing all those studies, finding out that there was a real demand for these systems out there, but nobody really supplying this demand. So I said, okay, here's a cool opportunity to do something fun. Um, so we are an integrator of zero emission hydrogen fuel cell systems and provide them for new builds and repowers for all the kind of vessels shown here. Uh, this is just the team here, uh, myself, Joe Burgard in the audience, and Thomas Escher are the co-founders, and then we have several very, very helpful, intelligent expert advisors um, helping us move forward. So what we're doing, we're building the water go round, which is the first hydrogen fuel cell vessel in the United States, and that's being done with a $3 million grant from California Air Resources Board and about $2 million from our partners. Um, we're working with customers. We're talking to them right now about how to help um, them meet their requirements. Uh, doing sales. We're productizing our system. So right now we buy components from here and there and sort of have the shipyard put it all together, but we want to have a nice little package, just like if you buy a Caterpillar engine. Uh, we do the fueling logistics, and um, just looking at the passenger vessel market, we're looking at about $200 million revenue is what we're projecting. Uh, so here's the water go round. It's an aluminum catamaran, about 70 feet long. Um, it has 84 seats inside, but it's reconfigurable. It can run 22 knots. 
It's got two 300 kilowatt or 400 horsepower motors, one in each hole, 360 kilowatts of fuel cell, and 100 kilowatt hours of battery. So to get up to 22 knots, we use the fuel cells and the batteries at the same time. Just some features here. The, the hydrogen tanks are on the top deck, if you look at the picture on the left, and the fuel cells are on the main deck aft of the cabin. Um, we can put these things down in the hole, and actually we'd prefer to. Uh, we can open up the top deck for passengers, but this is the first boat in the U.S., and we want to, even though I've been working with the Coast Guard for five years and know how to get it uh, approved, we want to make it as easy as possible for the first one. So to put everything up high, if you remember, hydrogen goes up whenever it leaks, right? So we put everything up high, and it takes care of a lot of the um, any safety questions about it. Here's the interior, um, just kind of a quick overview. Uh, as I mentioned, these seats can be um, rearranged or taken out altogether, um, which is important because th the uses that the California wants us to put this through is not just as a ferry or, or a tour boat, but they want to see it being used for freight movement, uh, research, and all these kinds of things during the three-month trials that we'll be having. When the project is finished, Golden Gate Zero will own the boat, and then we'll look to either sell it uh, to one of the interested um, operators that we've been talking to or charter it. Here are all the partners in the project. Golden Gate Zero is the lead. Um, the California Air Resources Board and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District are the funding administrators for this project. And then um, down below you have the technical technology suppliers and Red and White Fleet will be the operator during the trials. Um, so if this is exciting to you, there's different ways to get involved. Um, one is to become a user partner during the three-month demo. So as I mentioned, we have different, a lot of different uses where we want to put this through. And if you've got an idea for that, you know, where we can make a run to or how we could use the boat, I'd love to hear from you. Um, sponsorship is open for the vessel right now. Um, so just similar to the America's Cup sponsorship and that kind of thing, um, we're offering that on this one-of-a-kind boat that will be um, noticed around the world. Um, we can join the team. So if you're really interested, Golden Gate Zero, we have opportunities. Um, and that's about all I can say about it in public. But contact me um, after this if you're interested in learning more there. And, of course, you can always get your own water go around. Um, or this one. Or one like it. Or take your boat and we'll put a, a power system in there. So that's all I've got. This is my contact information, and look forward to having any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Joe Pratt, Zero Emission. Wonderful to have you here. Um, so, of course, we're going to have some questions from the audience, and we'll begin with a few questions. I want to ask right off the bat, uh, Joe, what is the total addressable market for zero emission hydrogen fuel vessels? Well, the total addressable market is really a, a timeline question. So uh, if you look at the regulations the total market's going to be the whole world within 50 years, say. But without looking that far out, we think we have a lot of uh, early adopters right now, especially in the passenger vessel industry. And with all the people who've reached out to us and I've been talking to over the last few years, um, I think we can capture about 10% of that market uh, within about five years. What percent did you say? About 10%. Mm -hmm. That's your target? Yeah. 10% in five years. Yeah. How big is that market in your five-year plan? In terms of revenue, it's about $200 million. Okay. Uh, now we have a question from the audience. Yes, sir. Oh, I was curious. Uh, Rolls-Royce is publishing something about a magnetic drive, uh, and I was wondering what, what was the power source for that, if you're familiar with it, and is that a competition for you? Um, I don't know what, you, what you're talking about. Um, I know a lot of... 
motors use a permanent magnets in there, so I don't know if that's what they're referring to. I, I don't know what specifically what you what you refer to. What percent of your uh, anticipated revenue is commercial versus recreational? Uh, hundred percent commercial. And the reason? That's where our focus is. So we're happy to um, look at other markets as well. You know, if we have recreational users who would like a system, we definitely do that. Um, I think we we're starting up as a new company. It's important to have a focus and know that market extremely well and attack that market. And that's what we're doing with um, commercial passenger vessels. Um, but if you know, there's a I've actually had people already reach out to me about putting these on yachts and things, and it's definitely something we'll look at, but it's not really our sales focus. What's, what's the sweet spot in commercial um, vehicles? What size vessels? You know, the sweet spot is um, right now, today, right? Cost and, and size of these systems is something like a red and white fleet tour boat. So um, what is that, Joe? 150 feet? Uh, what's the anhydra? I forget. Yeah, it's 130 feet. It's about somewhere between 800 and 1,000 horsepower. Okay. And, and 100, 100 passage? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll repeat it. So about 130 feet and 800 to 1,000 horsepower, you know, nice big monohull. Um, that's that's a real sweet spot for that. And the um, number of passengers? Uh, 600, yeah. So, mm -hmm. But, I mean, that kind of boat, right? That's not... I'm not saying that's the only one, um, but compared to like a high-speed catamaran, for example, or a container ship, for example, like th that sort of vessel is a really nice one. And in that kind of model, what's the time between fuel-ups? Uh, really depends. You could make it a day, you could make it a week, so it kind of depends on the operator what they want. And it's how much you store and how much hydrogen you store in the boat? Yep, and how hard you're running it also. You know, A lot of operators want to put... Uh, 1,500 horsepower on there, but usually they're only running 600, right? So then your fuel is going to last a lot longer. We have a question from the audience. Keith. Uh, two questions, actually. The first one is uh, the hydrogen cell consists of uh, a plate with uh, hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other. Uh, what's the plate made of? Um, the plate has an uh, internal membrane, which is sort of a, it's a kind of a polymer, it looks a lot like the plastic wrap you put on your food. So that's the very heart of it. Um, and that's what lets the protons from the hydrogen pass through. Um, it's, it's a little bit wet, so it allows these to go through with the chemistry there. Um, and then coated on each side of that plate is um, a graphite catalyst mixture on, on each side of this uh, membrane. So that's your three layers of the plate. So the second part was totally different. Who's your main competitor? Diesel engines right now. Um, so they're, they're ubiquitous. Everybody knows about them. Everybody's comfortable with them. And yeah, right now we don't have any competitors in the hydrogen space. Um, there is a startup company in Norway who's trying to do the same thing we are, um, but nobody in the U.S. right now. Uh, Julia, we have a comment from the cyber, the world of cyber. Yes. Bruce, Bruce Monroe. Yes. Uh, could you explain the process whereby you take natural gas and convert it to hydrogen? Absolutely. Um, so it's called steam methane reforming. And you take natural gas, you mix it with steam, you pass it over a catalyst at about 1,400 degrees. It's like a big furnace. Um, the methane um, breaks down. The, the C in there and the two H's, or the four H's, two H2's, and that combines with the O and the H's from water, and out the bottom you get hydrogen and CO2. Did I explain that okay? Yeah, but so there is a CO2 component to this process. That's correct. Right. CO2 byproduct. CO2 is a byproduct of steam methane reformation. So that's what I, one of the things I was, I, maybe I didn't explain it clearly, when you're making hydrogen from natural gas, there is CO2 emissions. Unless you're using a, a biofuel, a bio-natural gas, um, then the carbon you know, basically was just made, or, um, and so then you're releasing it back, and they say it's sort of uh, a net zero in that case. 
Or if you make hydrogen from electrolysis, you're just splitting water. There's no carbon involved. So that's another way to get carbon-free hydrogen. So how polluting is the manufacture of commercial hydrogen like you'll use? You know, the California Fuel Cell Partnership, who is working a lot with the automakers to bring out fuel cell electric vehicles, um, they've looked at the total pollution, what they call well to wheels. So from getting the fuel, um, processing it, and using it in the vehicle. And when they compare fuel cells, even produced from natural gas with all of its emissions, uh, when they compare fuel cell uh, cycle to the gasoline cycle, um, the carbon dioxide emissions are about half with the fuel cell cycle, um, and the, the pollutant emissions are, are much, much lower. I, I don't remember the numbers, but maybe 20 times lower or something like that. Hmm. Um, and that really goes back to one of the things I mentioned before is the high efficiency of the fuel cell. So you're, you have something that's maybe 50% efficient versus a gasoline engine, which might be 20% efficient. So you, that really helps a lot. Mr. Palmer has a question. Yes, sir. Is, uh, is the Navy sniffing around with this stuff? Are they, are they looking at it? Do you know? Absolutely. Yeah, the Navy's been looking at this for many years. Um, Office of Naval Research, um, and what's the other one? Carter Rock. Yeah, they've done different demonstration projects and um, investing in fuel cells. They they like it a lot because it's quiet and no heat signature. Will it work on a submarine? It is working on submarines. So European navies, German. Spanish Navy, there's a couple others, have fuel cell-powered submarines. Noel has a question. Yeah, a um, couple of related questions, actually. Earlier, it was talked about, why don't you do uh, uh, pleasure craft? You thought yeah. commercial. Also, another question about fuel reforming. Uh, these are related, in my mind, because if you wanted to use a, uh, a pleasure craft, uh, you're not going to have, it's going to be harder for pleasure craft to fill up with you know, pure hydrogen, because that's not readily available. And that's not a problem for a ferry, because you have your own, uh, your own refueling system set up there. But how hard, well, let me rephrase that. Is it practical to put some type of a fuel reforming unit on a, 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 a boat, uh, specifically a pleasure craft, so that it can go fill up with propane or even gasoline, uh, to, and then reform that? into hydrogen on board the vessel so it can be used anywhere. And then the second question is, if you were to use this for pleasure craft, are there other ancillary benefits that you can derive from using a fuel cell rather than a diesel engine? I mean, obviously it's quiet, so it's nice because you can have power while you're at anchor in, a, in, a marine, in a, uh, an area where you're not bothering people instead of running a gen set. But also, you know, the, the fact that it produces Heat might be useful for various reasons. Have you have you looked into all those things? So two two questions. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to remember everything. Um, first question was about fuel reforming on board. Those fuel reformation systems do not scale down very well. There are a couple com companies who make small reformer systems, but when I say small, they might be the size of a 20 foot shipping container. Um, those systems are also not very responsive. They like to be maintained at constant output for a long time. They don't like to get stopped and start and up and down and all that. So um, there is some research from Battelle was working on that, of trying to do some uh, small reformation systems. I don't think it's gone past the research stage. Um, there's a company in Sweden named PowerCell who has introduced a... A uh, fuel cell that uses um, diesel directly, and it has a reformer integrated, but I, had, I don't know if they've actually been able to successfully commercialize that. Uh, ancillary benefits of fuel cells? Yeah. So you brought up the heat. That's one thing you could use it for onboard heating. Another one is water generation. Um, so on the water go-round, I forgot to mention, uh, we'll have a little station there where you can fill up your water bottle with the exhaust and drink it. Uh, so you could carry, potentially, not have to carry water or, you know, not have to look for places with water. It's the same water you get from distilling water. You just need to add some minerals to it to make it drinkable, and then it's fine. 
So uh, the other, I guess one of the biggest benefits, sorry, Ron, mm -hmm. uh, would be you can make your own fuel. So imagine, um, you know, thinking about a yacht. This is somebody I talked to a few months ago where they are usually running under sail. Um, and maybe they just need their engine for, they don't use it very often anyway. And they're sitting there a lot of times. They have little windmills on the back or maybe a, f a solar panel on the deck or something like that. And so all the time when they're not using um, the electricity because they've got the sails, now they can be making small amounts but making hydrogen. And so over days or weeks that adds up and that gets you enough hydrogen to last a few days just running your engines. So that would be a benefit. So welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Our guest today is founder and CEO Joe Pratt of Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine. So Joe, when you think about um, the industrial uses of your technology, are you thinking about other applications besides selling them to commercial yachts or, you th or commercial uh, vessels? Are you thinking about uh, non-marine uses whatsoever? Um, not really. There's There are other companies out there who are doing fuel cells for trucks and buses and um, even airplanes, but there's nobody in the marine space. Why not buy equipment from them to um, refine for your use in marine? Yeah, it's funny you say that because the BAE system that we're using was originally developed for fuel cell buses. So they've taken that system on a bus and they've adapted it for marine. And now we're taking parts of their system and adding a fuel cell to it. So that's exactly what we're doing. So we have um, visitors from around the world watching us on Facebook Live, including our speaker next week. Welcome, Chris Welch, to our audience. Uh, Julia, talk to us about other people in the ether who ask, have questions. Online, Don Lunabus said he met a French engineer who was working on an automobile with that is hydrogen power. Can you tell us anything more about that? Um, there are, no, there are a lot of engineers working on hydrogen powered vehicles, so I'm not quite sure who he's referring to. Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, sorry, and all the, all the automotive manufacturers around the world are developing hydrogen fuel cell cars. So, um, let's talk about, uh, where you'd get hydrogen for your vehicle or other vessels thereafter. Uh, we have gas stations everywhere. Talk to us about uh, your expectation about distribution and where we'd find a hydrogen gas station. Are they going to be a new product horizontally added to existing service stations or will there be separate specialty service stations? Where would you get hydrogen for hydrogen fuel vehicles? Um, yeah, so two different um, sort of aspects here. What you're asking about is vehicles, which is a different situation than marine. Vessels. Yeah. Vessels. Okay. Where would you get it for vessels? So for a vessel, we'd get the hydrogen right from the source where it's made. It would get on a truck, it would go to the dock, and it would fuel the boat. So you'd go to a gas station or a fuel station for your... No. Hydro okay. Where would you go to get fuel? Fuel is not made at the gas station, right? right so right. fuel is made at a, a plant, maybe near in the Central Valley, mm -hmm. um, uh, Southern California, you know, there's different places around the country where they make hydrogen, make tons of it per day, right? Big plants. And a truck comes up there, it fills up, and it comes up here, and it fuels the boat, or wherever in the country. So the Matthew Turner, a yacht we've seen, a uh, sail training boat in the Bay Area, where does it go to get the fuel for its fuel cell? Uh, sorry, engine? the Matthew Turner is a diesel-electric hybrid. It's not okay. a fuel cell. The only fuel cell boat will be the water go round. Yeah. Okay. I, so I don't know where. Where will you get your fuel then? Where, how are you going to get it? Uh, we're going to get it from one of several different gas supply companies, um, such as Air Products, Lindy, Air Liquide, Praxair. They all make hydrogen and they all distribute it all over the country. So, as I mentioned before, what, 30, 30 million tons, 30,000 tons per day of hydrogen are made and used every day in the United States. So you'll have tanks delivered to some location where you'll pick up the tanks? Is that how it'll work? No, the tanks will be on the truck. The truck will show up at the dock. Okay. The hose will come out. It will connect to the tank on the boat, and the hydrogen will flow from the truck into the tank on the boat. And the PSI in the final tank is how much? Uh, 3,600. 
And so the cable or the pipe that takes it, the hose it takes through, is that can also be 3,000 PSI? It'll be rated at least 5,000 PSI. So that it can flow into the tank. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how much storage do you imagine keeping on your, on your, uh, on a typical vessel that you'd power? It really depends on the boat and the operator how Let's much. Let's imagine they want. it's Golden Gate. Let's imagine, you know, red and white fleet for bay f cruises. Yeah. So when we so the boat we're building will have about 250 kilograms. A kilogram you can figure has about the same amount of energy as a gallon of diesel. Okay. Um, when we did studies at Sandia, we had a vessel that was 1,200 kilograms, uh, and the research vessel I showed there, which had a range to get from San Diego to Hawaii. Uh, was around 20,000 kilograms. So it, it, it just depends on what you need. It's, it's like diesel, right? You just make your tank as big as you need it. Jim LeSier has a question. Jim. Yes. I, I'm really curious about the operating economics of a hydrogen-fueled vehicle versus a diesel-fueled vehicle. So if you take a ferry like the water go round with 80 passengers and six or 800 horsepower, whatever it has, yeah fueled by hydrogen and compare that with a red and white fleet, conventional diesel powered, how would it perform in terms of cost per gallon, dollars per mile, dollars per passenger mile, mm -hmm. whatever measures that the operator of the red and white fleet might use is, and how much better is a hydrogen fueled vessel? Yeah, so the, the, the cost um, depends on the timeline. And that's where we look at total cost of ownership um, as opposed to just capital cost or today's cost. So today it's more expensive to buy a fuel cell. It's more expensive to have hydrogen than diesel. Um, over the next 10 years, the fuel cell costs will come down to about 20% of what they are today. Um, diesel costs will continue to rise, uh, maybe 10 cents a gallon at least every year. Um, uh, hydrogen costs are coming down because of the more production capacity coming to the U.S. to support all the vehicles, uh, fuel cell vehicles. So to answer your question, if you were, if Red and White Fleet was to take two boats out there today and run them, it would be quite a bit more expensive to run the fuel cell boat. But if they look at that vessel for 20 years and the operating costs, which is really the biggest driver there, the fuel, as hydrogen fuel costs come down and diesel costs continue to increase um, and then combine that with the maintenance savings, then you get a lower total cost of ownership for hydrogen over its lifetime. So what year are you imagining the crossover in the cost of operation of the newer technology that you'll deploy versus diesel? It really depends on the vessel. Um, so, of, um, you know, we talked about like 800 horsepower uh, boat running bay cruises, something yeah. like that. That's going to be probably about three years. Um, you know, if you start looking at more challenging boats with a lot more power on board, a lot more um, usage, um, it could be maybe five years, something like that. Uh, what effect? What effect do you imagine in the? Uh, what effect will the current regulatory climate, where um, emission regulations are being relaxed, will have on the deployment of uh, your alternative energy? Federal regulations. Yes. Yeah. So it's funny if you uh, going through the you know the regulatory slides. In no place was the United States mentioned. <laughs> We've got the uh, environmental control area around the coast, but really the the people driving the emissions reductions in the United States are the individual states or ports or cities. It's not the federal government. So it really doesn't have a big impact. Um, what what's happening with the new administration right now? Uh, another question, Jimmy DeWitt, famous painter and yachtsman. <laughs> uh, great talk, Joe. This is fascinating. Thanks. I was going to ask you about airplanes, but you mentioned airplanes. So now I'm going to ask you, uh, you have the truck coming to the boat and filling the boat. Now, you, you can't have the truck come to the station put it at the station, and the boat come to the station and get the fuel. Yeah, you could do it either way. Um, so there's no reason you can't have a station on the dock. Um, it's just a lot more expensive. So it's much cheaper just to fuel directly into the boat than have to build something there at the dock. That, that's the only reason. Yeah, but the cars, when they go 
to get some fuel. It's got to be at the station. They're not going to have a truck come fill their car up. Right, and so that's what makes uh, Maritime such a great use case for hydrogen fuel cell technology <laughs> because you don't have to build that multi-million dollar station. Thank you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get, to, how many boats currently use, or how many uh, industries currently use this kind of technology? There are some cars. What about trucks? Yes. What, and what's the – give us some share of market of um, hydrogen fuel in, in autos and commercial uses. I don't have those numbers. I'm sorry. What's your, what's your estimate? You probably give a good guess. Um, trucks are in the demonstration mode right now. So there's, you know, a handful or a dozen. Uh, cars, there's 3,000 on the road in California right now. Um, Toyota, Honda, Toyota plans to have 30,000 by 2020, 2021. Honda, similar. Hyundai, similar. So we'll probably see 100,000 cars in California um, within three years, uh, maybe four. Um, there are a lot of fuel cell forklifts. I don't have the numbers. Um, the operators like those better than the battery that they're replacing. Sorry. And, then and the uh, the cell phone tower backup, that's a very popular application for fuel cells right now. So talk about that. Um, so every cell phone tower where, you know, gets we get the signal from, they're required to have a backup power system. Um, and Prescott Stone there in the audience knows a lot more about these. That was refueling those towers was his business for a while. Um, but basically, the, you can have a diesel generator there, you can have a battery there, you can have a fuel cell there. And the, the fuel cells uh, perform better than any of the other ones. So that's why a lot of these companies are putting in fuel cells as backup power systems. So as you look into the future, what are the competitive technologies for uh, commercial maritime use? Uh, does solar have a shot at competing with you? Why is this better than solar mm -hmm. and or other forms of propulsion for maritime commercial vessels? Yeah, so solar, you, you, could co you could cover your whole boat in solar and you would not get close to powering the power you need um, to get out the propeller. You could probably power your lights, right? Um, the, you know, there's new vessels coming out with large fixed wing sails or Flettner rotors on there that sort of boost the power. Those are interesting. I, I'm tracking those. Um, I don't know if you'll get full power out of those, but that can definitely help. Um, not quite sure what else is out there. You know, the difficulty with maritime is you don't just need to make the energy. You have to keep it on board in a small space for a long period of time. How big are the tanks going to be in your first proposed vessel? How much will they hold? Um, the, for, the tanks on our boat will hold about 250 kilograms of hydrogen. And how much operating time will that represent? About one to two days. One or two days. How many, yeah. how many operating hours would that be? Uh, eight, eight to ten hour days. So 16, 20 ish hours of operation. Right. Uh -huh. And that depends on how you use it. You know, cruising around the bay at 10 knots is quite a bit different than going back and forth to Oakland at 20. And what will it cost to fill those tanks? At the, at the earlier prices. We Good recognize question. that the price economics is going to change with adoption curves. But so to begin with, what do you think it's going to cost? Uh, These are the tough questions, Jim. Yeah, you're asking me <laughs> tough questions. I have to do math. <laughs> <laughs> We've only got a PhD here. <laughs> uh, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars maybe each fill up, something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh -huh. roughly. And just get this straight, a truck is going to come to your location, right. and the fuel truck will come and fill up right right inside the location. Yeah. Great. One last question. Yes, another question in the audience? No. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you, you, said earl you said earlier that uh, currently it's more expensive to go with hydrogen fuel cell than diesel. Um, and, of course, in the future, I'm sure the economics, as you said, are going to improve. But... Today, right now, if, it, if you were to scale this up to a really large industrial scale like commercial maritime freighters and tankers and things like that, is it possible that by departing from some of the methods you've talked about, using more exotic types of fuel cells, not proton exchange membranes, but high temperature you know, 
molten metal fuel cells and things like that, and and maybe doing the reforming on board the the, 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 the ship. Can you get to the point where today, right now, with today's technology, it's actually more cost effective to use this type of technology than to just run diesel? I don't think so. Diesel engines are so mature, um, compact, um, cheap. It's very difficult to beat diesel engines for cost right now. Yeah, because when you start going to – so the, I don't know if you heard it. The question was even with the efficiency gain. So when you start going to large ships, those diesel engines are pretty darn efficient. You know, it's not like a, a small boat out here on the bay. You know, those, those big diesels can get 40% efficient. So you, you start losing that margin. So that's why, you know, for, for Golden Gate Zero, we're really focusing on sort of the smaller vessels to get started as cost starts coming down – now we can start looking at the bigger vessels where it's really the, the cost has to make sense right away. So, Joe, uh, last question on financing. So you've taken a $3 million investment from a strategic partner, and then you have private investors who are investing in the venture as well. That's it's a correct. corporation. Yes. And are you essentially looking at having an operator model or a manufacturer model, or are you a bit of both to begin with? Uh, manufacturing. So the manufacturing model. Yeah. You'll then you won't be licensing the technology to manufacturers. You'll be making the equipment and then deploying it into different uh, use cases. Correct. That's right. And supporting the operator. Um, so one of the first things when I talk to uh, vessel operators who want it say, "Well, this is fantastic. Well, where do I get the hydrogen?" <laughs> so say, okay, mm -hmm. we'll take care of that for you. You know, on one hand we could say, "Oh, here's a number of air products. Give them a call," but we don't want to do that. Say, hey, you can take care of all that through us. So that would be the one part um, of the business that's not exactly just product sales, but it's also supporting the fueling side. So it's fascinating. We listen to lots of different speakers who have an effect on our environment. It's wonderful to see uh, um, a commercially oriented uh, scientist, engineer, who wants to deploy technology, which we think is going to make our uh, world a more safe place to live and to recreate and to commercially travel in the future. Thanks very much. We've been listening to Joe Pratt, founder and CEO of Golden Gate Zero Mission Marine. Thank you so much for being with the Lunch Yachting Joe. Thank you, Thank Ron. You. It's been great. Good talk, mate. Good on you, mate. Good on you. Oh, yes. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. So keen to stop us three